Well, good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this IISS discussion meeting on Iran's uh, regional posture. This is part of our uh, pre-Manama dialogue uh, discussion series where we'd like to take up some of the issues that will be on the agenda at the Manama dialogue or uh, corridor talk uh, in Bahrain. Uh, we're going to focus on the nuances of Iran's evolving regional strategy. In particular, what are the drivers behind Iran's actions? How has Iran's strategy developed in the face of the Trump administration's uh, very uh, strong pressure? And uh, if we can, what does Iran's regional posture mean for state and non-state actors? So I'm joined by um, three, not two, uh, experts as originally billed. Uh, you see two experts on uh, on the stage here, as it were, and one in New York. Dina Esfandiari um, uh, threw out her back and was unable to travel from New York to um, Washington. So um, we've hooked her up um, uh, technologically. But just in case that didn't work, we recruited uh, Ali Baez from the Iran Crisis Group to join us. And uh, fortunately, we now have three uh, experts uh, to talk about this important topic. So just to briefly um, introduce the three, Dina is a fellow at the Century Foundation and a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of uh, uh, Harvard Kennedy School's Center for Science and International Affairs. She formerly was a fellow at the Center for Security and uh, Science and Security Studies at King's College London. And most importantly, uh, in her resume, she worked at the IISS uh, Nonproliferation and uh, and uh, then called Disarmament Program in London uh, with me from 2009 to uh, 2015. She's the recent co-author with uh, Ariane Tabatabai of Triple Axis, Russia, Iran, and Power Politics. Ambassador Barbara Leaf, to my right, recently joined the Washington Institute as a distinguished visiting fellow after serving as US ambassador to the um, United Arab Emirates from 2014. Before arriving in Abu Dhabi, she served as the deputy assistant secretary for the Arabian Peninsula in the Bureau of uh, Near Eastern Affairs and as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Iraq. Uh, she had previously directed the US Provincial Reconstruction Team in Basra, Iraq, Iraq, and she was the department's first director of the Office of Iranian Affairs, where we first met, I think, 11 years ago. And Ali Baez, as I said, uh, he's with the International Crisis Group, where he uh, heads, uh, he's the Iran Project uh, Director. He also, uh, previous to the ICG was uh, the Iran Project head at the Federation of American Scientists. Uh, he held a position as a postdoc fellow at Harvard University uh, previous to that. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. We're going to do this conversational style. And I'd like to start with Dina uh, while, the, uh, while the hookup is still uh, live to ask uh, Dina uh, for her perspective on how the Islamic Republic of Iran sees the region and what is it trying to achieve. Uh, and then in the theaters of its involvement, uh, what are its priorities? So, Dina, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm really sorry I couldn't be there um, with you. So, in terms, of, um, in terms of how Iran sees the region, uh, let's talk about first what its foreign policy drivers are. Um, when the Islamic Republic happened, uh, the first foreign policy driver was religion, the revolutionary zeal. But the Islamic Republic that we have today is a much more pragmatic one. Um, nationalism actually became a, a bigger driver than religion and revolutionary zeal because they realized that after the course of an eight-year war, religion wasn't enough to galvanize um, the entire population and have the nation. Uh, obviously, its internal politics is a big driver of how it acts in the region. And um, economics is another big one. Uh, in recent years, its ability to contravene sanctions has been a major driver of this foreign policy. Its goals in the region are not that different to other countries. Um, it hopes to preserve its territorial integrity, to secure its borders, to ensure its long-term development, expand ties with other countries and increase its influence in the region. Um, importantly, Tehran wants to be sure that it remains a force to be reckoned with in the region. And of course, it wants to minimize any risk of conflict on its borders while it ensures the removal of foreign forces from the Middle East. Um, of course, Tehran believes that regional security should be managed by the countries that are in the region, uh, which is in total opposition to its uh, 12 Arab neighbors, 
who believe that regional security can only be secured with a greater number of, uh, of uh, foreign powers involved in the region. So Iran does not aim to gratuitously disrupt the region. It just wants to secure its interests and its influence. Um, its limited and outdated military capabilities restrict its ability to project power, and so it draws on uh, you know, proxy groups in the region, using a lot of soft power to gain influence, um, and of course developing uh, some of its conventional weapons. Um, but it's important to remember that a lot of Iran's involvement in regional conflicts hasn't always played out in its favor. Um, Syria is actually an interesting example of that. While on the ground, it's managed to keep the Assad regime in power, um, its reputation has taken a real beating, and today there's a little debate in Iran, um, or there has been at least for the last of a while, about whether Iran's involvement in Syria has been worth it. In terms of its priorities in the region, which was uh, Mark's second question, um, uh, I would say that Iraq comes as Iran's number one priority. Iran wants a unified but not overly strong country, um, and it wants a central authority in place that it can work with so that it can secure its various uh, economic, security, religious, uh, and broader political interests in the country. Um, Iraq is absolutely vital to it. We have to remember there's nine, more than 900 miles of porous border between Iran and Iraq. Um, and recently, with ISIS's takeover of the country, um, it, Iran really saw the impact of having um, such, a, such a threat so close to its border. Uh, so Iraq definitely comes as its number one priority. I would argue that Syria perhaps comes in second. Um, it's, a, it's a symbol of and a means for its influence in the region, and it allows it to have reach all the way up to the Mediterranean and, and right up to Israel. Um, but again, as we, as we argued, Syria has been a bit of a contentious issue for Iran because it's been very expensive. It hasn't been great for its reputation in terms of uh, the Assad regime's atrocities against its own people. Um, so it's been very interesting to watch how um, the forces that are involved in Syria have caught on to the idea of PR and how to sell um, their involvement in, uh, in Syria. So one quick example is that the, the liberation of towns like Aleppo have been um, have been compared to the liberation of Khor al in Iran in 1982, which was a, a key moment um, in in, uh, in Iran's war against Iraq. So there's a there's focus on religious parallels um, in order to give their presence significance and, and legitimacy. And finally, uh, I would say that the third regional conflict. Uh, uh, in terms of order of priority, or at least if there were other ones, I would probably put them ahead of this one, uh, is Yemen, because Yemen has, Iran has very little strategic interest in, in Yemen. Yemen. It's uh, relatively unimportant to it, it doesn't have a border <coughs> with Iran, it's poor in resources, so poor in strategic value to Iran. Um, the Shia population there has been a useful ally to it, um, but besides being able to hook Saudi Arabia um, in the eye with its presence in Yemen, Iran doesn't really have a long-term strategic goal for the country. What this conflict has done for it, though, is that the perception of Iranian control of the Houthis, um, or at least Iranian involvement in Yemen, over time, it, it's actually ended up being what a lot of people perceived it as being, because Iranian control of the Houthis was not complete by all means, and the Houthis didn't necessarily take into consider consideration all of Iran's borders. Um, but today, uh, the two really do work closely together. So I think I'll stop there. Okay, okay, thanks, Dina. I, I noticed that in your description of Iran's motives and priorities, you didn't use the term malign activities uh, or any, uh, or any uh, other such prejudicial uh, adjectives. Um, but thank you for giving a, um, a, a nuanced uh, that presentation. Barbara, I'd like to ask you a kind of similar question, your perspective of uh, Iran's goals and priorities in its regional involvement and the tools it uses uh, to reach them. And, and then maybe if you would, who's in charge of its regional activities? So I, I think I, you know, one of the points I was uh, thinking about is, is something that Dina has just touched on, which is this issue um, uh, of whether Iran is a revolutionary power. And although many of us who've been looking at, at, at uh, the country for some years 
would argue that it's not. There is still this conviction out there, and you hear it in Washington, you certainly hear it in the Gulf and in some other parts of the Middle East, uh, that, that Tehran is in a, in a revolutionary mode. I, I don't think so at all, and for some of the reasons that Dina cited, um, but it's also 40 years on, um, every revolution tends to, to burn itself out. So I, I look at the regime as primarily committed to its own continuance by playing an offensive defense. Um, I think Ali has called it a forward defense, or he's quoted uh, Iranian officials saying that. And I look at the, uh, the way the, the, the regime looks at the region uh, in terms of threats through the guise of four, Iraq, Israel, Saudi Arabia, US, and I think they, they, the, Iraq stays number one uh, but the others sort of, of morph up and down the scale of, of, of nearness of, of, of uh, threat. Now, what I see the, the regime consistently doing over, over years, and, and I, I made a checklist of, of, the, of the ways that it uses these, these tools, these asymmetrical tools, the sort of a, a standard set, the sort of Hezbollah model, and what Hezbollah has provided for, the, for, the, for Tehran in terms of Lebanon and Syria, but then there's a whole um, evolution of these tools. And so running through them quickly, I would say it's, it's creating and directing proxy forces, but, but most importantly, splintering the proxy forces. You see this in Syria and Iraq, and they splinter them precisely for the ability um, to corral and direct the forces, local forces, as opposed to the government, be it Assad or 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 the uh, or the government in Baghdad having a, a very clear and direct control over them, developing and resourcing a proxy style re relationship with local actors, and you see this, uh, of course, in Yemen uh, via the Houthis. That degree of control is is debatable, and that's part of the problem because it goes right along with transferring advanced missile technology and training. You see that in Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen other lethal aids such as IEDs and training on them and and, uh, and you see that in Bahrain and Yemen. And the degree, the speed with which those transfers occurred in Yemen is quite striking precisely because there isn't, I agree, there is not a, an overriding national security purpose to uh, in Yemen, qua Yemen for Iran except as a vehicle through which to tie the Saudis down to distract the Saudis and so forth. You've got the sort of what I would call the next gen use of Hezbollah in the Syria conflict, which is for the first time as an expeditionary force and for a non-resistance role. And I think that's quite significant. And Hezbollah took a bit of a political beating in Lebanon for that, but has obviously um, um, surmounted that. You've got what I, what colleagues of mine uh, at the Institute would call the creation of a Shia foreign legion, specifically in uh, Syria. Uh, there's elements of that in Yemen, very nascent, but it's really developed um, in Syria, where you where you saw uh, Iran drawing in Afghan, Iraqi, initially Iraqi, but then Afghan and Pakistani Shia fighters, and again directing them in a way that the government itself did not. Um, the, the other new is creation, or the effort at creation of a sort of a more enduring and and expansive defense and, intel and intelligence uh, architecture in Syria, and that's obviously um, a sort of a, a breaking point for Israel. Um, suborning, co-opting of the state, that has been the case in both Iraq and Syria. Threatening for the first time uh, via a proxy, uh, a really critical international shipping point, the Bab al-Mandab. Um, and then, you know, what I would say is overall, the, the, the pattern that comes out uh, across the region in Iran's uh, approach is is exploiting disordered Arab states. So I would not argue that Iran was the creation of that disorder, but rather it exploits it. It, 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 it sort of runs along the seams of, of fractured states, states that have a significant or an, or an extent a Shia minority that can be mobilized, um, and so uh, accentuates deepens the disorder, and I would argue that's especially profound in Iraq. The creation of, of militias such as Asab al haq um, uh, Badr, uh, the, the, the resourcing, not so much the directing of Badr or Muqtad al-Sadr's Jaysh al-Mahdi, but this proliferation of other actors which have 
then morphed into the political sphere. I will end here and just say, that for me, the enduring goals for, for Tehran are reducing US military presence as a means of attaining what Tehran would, would look at as its rightful dominating role to some degree, but rightful historical role in the region. Well, thanks, Barbara. Um, by the way, when you, when you said, um, used the term next gen use of Hezbollah, uh, I don't know if you, you got the copyright on that term, but um, <laughs> it reminded me that I forgot to say that this is on the record and we're gonna be tweeting some of these bone mows, if you don't mind. Uh, and then the, uh, the entire video uh, will be online, uh, I think, tomorrow. Uh, Ali, um, I'd like to ask you your reactions to what Dina and Barbara have said, but also take us a, a little bit further and maybe in the current uh, situation, how has uh, uh, the Trump administration's withdrawal from the JCPOA affected uh, Iran's regional posture, if it has in any way? Great, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for being here. Is this on? No. no. Is it now? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, I um, largely agree with almost everything Barbara and Dina said, um, and I think it's key uh, to understand the sources of Iranian conduct if the administration is to devise policies that are effective in containing uh, Iran's influence. Um, and I would say the main premise of what the administration is trying to do at the moment is misguided. Uh, the idea is that if you deprive Iran of the resources that it has to advance its uh, regional strategy, uh, that it would automatically temper Iran's behavior. Now, you can look at the experience of uh, the past few years, just as an example, to see that there is actually very little correlation between the amount of dollars that Iran has in its bank account and its regional policy. Uh, I think the most striking example is 2011-2012, the height of the previous multilateral sanctions regime, when the Iranian economy was shrinking at the rate of 7%, inflation was at 40%, and that is precisely when Iran actually expanded its military intervention in Iraq and Syria, uh, sent troops and, uh, and military equipment there. Um, and you know, in discussions with administration officials, I often tell them, Look at, you know, this is not, uh, and uh, you don't need to hypothesize about this issue. You can just look at the record of the past 40 years. There's a 40-year record of Iran's economic performance and 40-year record of Iran's military intervention. And then you quickly realize that there is actually very little correlation between the two. Now, that's why I said it's important to understand the sources of Iranian conduct because what they do from their perspective is defensive. Um, their missile program is defensive, is a, is, a, is a deterrence. Their support of proxies and allies in the region is also to deter a direct strike on Iranian soil. If you talk to Iranian officials, they tell you the reason Israel didn't attack Iran during the previous nuclear standoff was because it was afraid not of Iran, but of Hezbollah's missiles and rockets, right? Um, and that logic still applies, and it means that the further the administration threatens Iran, the Iranians have a higher motivation to double down on what they see as these defensive policies. Um, I also don't see a direct correlation between the JCPOA and Iran's regional policies. I would argue what Iran has done in the region in the past few years has been more a function of realities on the ground and its threat perception rather than JCPOA or uh, the amount of money that Iran has been able to put its hands on after the deal. Uh, for instance, when Iran asked Russia to intervene in Syria in 2015, it wasn't because the nuclear deal was done or Iran had a lot of money in its account, but it was because the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Emiratis at the time had better coordinated Syrian uh, opposition forces and they were gaining ground. We have done a study of um, Houthi missile strikes in uh, Saudi Arabia um, and you can look at, you can superimpose that graph against uh, the Saudi coalition um, uh, bombing campaigns in Yemen and uh, also um, uh, territorial gains. And you see that rather than a function of what dictates uh, come from Tehran, uh, Houthi decision to use missile strikes on Saudi soil is a function of the realities on the ground. Uh, so that is one thing that I really believe that the administration doesn't understand. Um, now, uh, to your question, 
the Iranians at the moment perceive a collusion against them uh, by the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Israelis to push the US into a military confrontation with, with Iran. This is something that some of the regional countries have wanted for a while, but now they see an opportunity in the Trump administration to achieve that objective of significantly weakening Iran in ways that they haven't been able to do so in the past few years. The Iranians don't want to play into the hands of their rivals because, first of all, they're winning in the region. Uh, they're doing pretty good from their perspective. Uh, second, they have the moral high ground internationally at the moment. Just look at the past week. Uh, the Europeans uh, in New York came out with this uh, mechanism of helping the Iranians survive U.S. sanctions. Um, the International Court of Justice voted in favor of Iran. A uh, UN Security Council resolution uh, uh, meeting that the president headed actually demonstrated how isolated the U.S. is on the international scene on this issue. So the Iranians have very little interest in rocking the boats and also providing a pretext for a strike on Iran. And as such, they're demonstrating restraint. I mean, look at the uh, border between Syria and Israel. Israel has struck more than 200 times in the past year and a half Iranian assets and, and personnel on the ground in Syria. And the response from Iranians has been really not much. Uh, they haven't really retaliated. Um, but my fear is that this situation can change um, in um, one of the two scenarios in 2019. The scenario in which the US sanctions turn out to be as effective as the administration is hoping for. As such, in 2019, the Iranians will have less to lose and therefore they will be less risk averse. In fact, I asked a senior Iranian official recently, what would you do if this economic situa situation gets out of control? And that's when he said, uh, the system in Iran would welcome a crisis because then that would change the subject domestically. So people will come to streets complaining about unpaid uh, salaries and uh, you know, low quality of, of weather in Iran or drinking water uh, would, would be totally suppressed because we will be in a war type situation at the time. The second scenario is that sanctions are not as effective as the administration is hoping for because they don't have international support and under those circumstances, I, I'm afraid that, again, US regional allies at the time would have a higher motivation of trying to provoke a conflict between Iran and, uh, and the US. And unfortunately, there is, there is so many flashpoints, so much friction, and so little diplomacy that I think an escalation uh, could happen even inadvertently. Well, thanks very much, Ali. You stepped in uh, uh, quite brilliantly to uh, uh, give us that perspective. It, it strikes me that some might think our panel is imbalanced because we don't have somebody giving a perspective from uh, Iran's adversaries in the regions. In the region. So I, I want to make sure that during the, uh, the time when we um, seek uh, comments or questions that if there's somebody who would like to uh, give a counterpoint, I want to make sure we, we get that uh, recorded. Also, if there's anybody from the administration or, or who would like to uh, present uh, an administration-related point of view um, we'll, we'll try to get that to for balance. But let's go one more uh, round for me asking a couple questions to the panelists. And maybe, Dina, we'll go to this uh, third, uh, you know, the least of Iran's priorities, Yemen. It doesn't matter as much to, to Iran. Does that mean that there, it seems to me that means that there should be more possibility for Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia to reach uh, uh, some kind of a compromise, to engage. And I'm wondering um, what you uh, would think if that's, can there be dialogue over Yemen? Barbara, I'm gonna pose the same question to you and, and what would uh, have to happen to make, uh, to make that possible? So Dina, give me a short answer to that difficult question. I think that Yemen would have been the perfect um, conflict for the Gulf Arabs and Iran to sit down and have dialogue. And the fact the Iranians, a few years ago, um, trying to make it clear that this was something they were definitely willing to hold negotiations on um, as, as, a, as kind of olive branch to, the, to its Gulf Arab neighbors. The problem was that um, at the time, and I think that's probably the position today, Iran's Gulf Arab neighbors maintain that Iran has no role at all in Yemen, in fact, in Arab affairs. So as a precondition to dialogue, they are requesting that Iran unilaterally removes itself from Arab affairs before they even begin a dialogue, which of course is an absolute no-go for Iranian officials. They're saying, okay, well, if we want to discuss 
you know, Iran's influence in Arab affairs, well, we have to discuss it first before we unilaterally withdraw ourselves from that arena. So I think Yemen would have been a very good talking point. Uh, but I think that the Gulf Arabs are nervous at the idea of sitting down and having a dialogue with Iran on it because it kind of legitimizes Iranian influence and presence um, on the ground. The other problem today is that following the Gulf crisis that broke out uh, in the summer of last year, the Gulf Arab states have lost uh, the, the relative unity with which they, um, they make policy on Iran. So let me caveat that by saying there was very little unity to begin with because they all had a different opinion of how they wanted to proceed with, uh, with Iran. But at least under the umbrella of the GCC, they were able to act as one uh, group. Um, today, they're not able to do that anymore. And, and Iran um, is successfully able to, to pick them apart and speak, speak with the leadership of the states that are somewhat more friendly towards Iran. Countries like Oman, with whom it's always had a dialogue, but today uh, Qatar, Kuwait, um, much more so than, than Saudi Arabia and the UAE, for example. So I think the problem today is that it's going to be very difficult to have any kind of dialogue um, between both sides of the Gulf. Uh, on the one side, because the Gulf Arabs don't want to engage an Iran that is in a stronger position today than it was before, and also an Iran that's involved in their affairs. And on the Iranian side, there's perhaps less of a desire to do it because it's more costly domestically after um, all of the, uh, the rhetorical attacks it's had from, uh, from the Gulf Arab states. And also because it doesn't see the point because it's already engaging on a bilateral basis with the countries that it wants to engage with. Thanks. Thanks, Dina. Barbara, as I said, I wanted to ask you a similar question and, and maybe an additional one. You referred to the Bab al-Mandib as uh, the vital waterway that Iran can disrupt as one of its tools, or maybe it's already uh, been doing that with the Houthis, according to one uh, allegation. Um, this, this could get bigger. Definitely. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I have puzzled over um, things like Yemen, uh, or issues like Yemen, because there is a degree of recklessness there that I'm not used to attributing to uh, to Tehran. Recklessness in the degree, uh, in the speed with which they transferred training and high-end high technology, and so formed a capability for the Houthis, who are, who do act independently, to essentially fire away at ships, and not just coalition ships, commercial ships. Um, sort of indiscriminately at, at various points, uh, uh, traversing the, the Bab al-Mandeb. Um, the lobbing of, of uh, missiles deeper and deeper into Saudi soil, you know, it's, it's just a matter of time before there's a, you know, a, catastro a catastrophic uh, um, hit, whether designed or, or uh, accidental. So, um, and then, what does Iran imagine the Saudis do? What does Iran imagine the Saudis do with this administration? That's something I puzzled over. And yes, it's a it's a it's a cheap sort of investment, but it's it is there's a degree of recklessness. And on the flip side, um, I would I would um, differ with Dina on this point. You know, in um, between two contesting powers, great or small, you don't always have to announce you're doing something. What you can do is stop doing something, and it will be become apparent. So no, um, by no means do um, do the Yemenis, uh, you know, uh, or the the Gulf Arabs want to sit down at the table with Iranian officials and deliberate over Yemen. But rather, um, and, and the quest for getting the Houthis to the table, which once again we've seen um, uh, has has failed. Folks have, have relied on the Omanis, on the Omanis' good offices to get them there. They have tried and not been able to this time around. So who could pressure the Houthis via cutting off uh, their resourcing or just simple p political pressure to show up and, um, and um, uh, productively engage in a political process? Tehran could do that. That would be a powerful signal. Now, do they have a, an interest in doing so? Apparently not. But on the other hand, that is one way to calm one um, boiling pot. Um, I, I look across the region and, and think, OK, the Iranians look at the short, or let's say Qasem Soleimani's side of, 
Iran's foreign policy apparatus. He looks at the region and says, how do I neutralize um, these threats? I suborn and weaken uh, Iraq. I control much of what um, uh, on the ground occurs um, via these, these foreign fighters. I embed them. I work with, the, with uh, Bashar al-Assad to, um, to implant them further, change demographics, et cetera. How is that a lasting kind of security for Iran that it, it seeks? So I don't, I don't accuse Tehran of thinking strategically in the sense because I think it's stuck in a, in a sort of a trope that is quite destructive to its own interests. And yes, there is mirror imaging between the Gulf Arabs, especially the Saudis and Emiratis, and Tehran, and the US these days, and the Israelis, uh, much as I think of you know, mirror imaging um, with all of its attendant risks between Moscow and Washington in the Cold War. But there's greater volatility there. And something, yes, could go terribly wrong. And then final, my, my final question is really, how does, how does Iran adjust to a different Iraq? Can it, can it attain a normal relationship with this first tier threat to it? And if it doesn't, I think we, we risk, or the regime risks seeing blowback there first. Thanks very much, Barbara. Um, Ali, if, if you're welcome to comment on, on, on that point, but I also wanted to ask you, when the next round of sanctions is levied on, on November 4th, it's, it's going to be uh, you know, very strong additional economic pressure. Pressure, economic pressure is the main policy tool the Trump administration is using. If that doesn't work, according to uh, you know, your scenarios, uh, what other tools uh, does the administration have at its disposal um, that you might see it using? Is engagement one of those, these tools? There's, you know, Trump talks uh, about uh, another summit with the Iranians maybe. Is that at all possible? Um, just a quick point on Yemen first. Uh, I agree with Barbara 100% that uh, the situation is uh, uh, really perilous because the Iranians have done, uh, um, you know, train and equip with, uh, with the Houthis, but they don't necessarily have command and control. And there is a uh, precedent there again because we remember that uh, the Iranians told the Houthis specifically not to go to Sana'a and they ignored them and went to Sana'a and then they told them not to go to Aden and they ignored them and went to Aden. Um, the, and that's why the Houthis are not really a proxy of Iran uh, and there is not the kind of chemistry that exists between Hezbollah and, and Iran and as such the situation could uh, easily get out of control. The problem is the Iranians have actually tried to be, to be fair to them, they've tried to be uh, constructive uh, on Yemen, precisely because the reasons that uh, Dina described, uh, it's not a strategic priority for them. It's a low-hanging fruit that they're willing to give away. Uh, but you know, with the Iranians, I always say it's, a, it's not a bizarre mentality, it's a bazaar mentality. It really depends on what they get in return. Uh, the problem is they can't really move forward much on Yemen because the Saudis have very little interest in uh, finding an accommodation that Iran is part of it because that would legitimize Iran's role in Yemen and that's the last thing that the Saudis want to do. Um, the Iranians are now engaged in these negotiations with four European countries, the, uh, uh, the E3 plus Italy, uh, known as the E4 format, and uh, they have agreed, uh, for example, uh, right before Ramadan, uh, to help facilitate a ceasefire. Uh, the Iranians met with the Houthis and convinced them to accept the ceasefire. Uh, the Europeans failed to convince the UAE and the Saudis to accept it because the Hodeida operation was in the making. Um, and this is just a redux of uh, uh, 2015, I believe, that uh, Kerry and Zarif negotiated a similar ceasefire. Uh, and again, Zarif tried to uh, deliver and Kerry couldn't. Because I think at the moment, uh, the Saudis have every interest in heating up these tensions rather than de-escalating in the hope that uh, eventually the US would cut off the head of the snake. Um, so that's, that's where the risk uh, lies. Um, look, I, I would argue that the president himself might be quite interested in having a summit with President Rouhani uh, in having a deal, a broader, better, bigger agreement with Iran. The problem is no one in his team, in his national security team, even in his members of his family, share that motivation. Uh, so that makes it particularly difficult. Um, 
And on the Iranian side, as Zarif has been saying when he was in New York last week, this is more a liability than an asset for them. Obviously, they've already been burned as a result of the JCPOA. Uh, so Zarif and Rouhani have very little political capital to engage in a risky engagement with the Trump administration, given uh, how mercurial the president has turned out to be uh, on, on some of these issues. Um, and the problem is, generally, I think, when it gets to the region, um, I, I, I think it would be very hard with the current team in place to um, find an accommodation that would recognize that Iran is part of the region, it has some legitimate security concerns, and if there is to, uh, a settlement, it has to also take those issues into account. And I think this is a general problem with the hardliners in this city and the Iran's regional rivals, which is that uh, you know, there is a ceiling to how much influence Iran can have in the region as a Persian country surrounded by Turks and Arab, as a Shia country surrounded by Sunnis. But there's also a floor to how much influence Iran can have. And I think that floor uh, has always been defined in very maximalist terms. As Dina said, Iran should have nothing to do with Arab affairs. Or that Secretary Pompeo says that Iran should have zero presence in Syria. And that's what makes finding an accommodation uh, I would say particularly difficult. Okay, thanks, Ali. I'm going to just offer one counterpoint, and we don't have to debate it, but the administration does uh, say repeatedly that it does want uh, to negotiate a deal with Iran. Brian Hook made this point repeatedly, talked about a new deal. So I think at least the statement is, is one of engagement, not necessarily a summit. I understand uh, the other implications for that. So let's, uh, let's go to the usual fashion. Um, there will be a microphone coming. Who's got the, you got the microphone here. And I'll, I'll take the young lady uh, here first. And please state the, your name and, uh, and try to make a concise uh, comment. Sure. My, my name is Yasmin Farou. I'm a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, I have a question to Ali, but also the other panelists are welcome to answer. I'm, um, I have a question about how identical are uh, the threat perceptions of Gulf countries and the U.S. about Iran. Like, are the priorities the same? You said that um, the Trump, that the president himself is willing to have a summit with Rouhani. What kind of compromise would be, would he be willing to make, would it be the similar, would it please the Gulf countries? Or are they seeking the same from Iran? Because the, the president seems to stress a lot missiles and nuclear uh, weapons, whereas um, for Saudi Arabia and Gulf countries, Iran's malign activities as per the statements of the State Department and the Secretary of State seem to be as important as the nuclear weapon. Okay, thanks very much. I think what we'll do is take three questions in the beginning. I'll ask uh, uh, in the front here and then way in the back. Harlan Ullman. Um, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council and the Naval War College. Uh, my question really stems from what Mark asked about divergence of thoughts. And I'm reminded that in December 1961, President Kennedy sent Walt Rostow and Max Taylor to Vietnam. And when they came back and reported, Kennedy asked, have you guys been to the same country? Now, the comments you were making, I think, are very moderate about Iran. But obviously, in the administration, and particularly in Congress, there's a variant view that Iran is the enemy, that it's a benign, it's a, a malign actor, and some want regime change. How do you account for these really different perceptions? And who do you think is right and why? Thanks, Harlan. Good question. And then and if you could scurry back to the final, uh, the end there with the microphone in the, in the far back. Thanks. Alan Kieswetter at the Middle East Institute, and I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. My question is, what does the panel make of the administration's idea of a Middle East strategic alliance, uh, which was, I gather, still in, maybe the word is inchoate, but uh, still being developed? What role could it have? And frankly, given the divisions uh, within the GCC, why would they propose it? OK, thanks very much. These are three good questions. Um, uh, I'll ask each of the panelists to take up uh, whichever one of the three they would like to do. And Dina, um, I think I'll start with you um, while we make sure that the video link is still good. Sure. Um, uh, so on the first one, um, are GCC US direct sections the same? In short, they're similar. Um, obviously, uh, both consider the Iranians a threat to the region. 
Um, but as you as you rightly pointed out, I think that the focus on um, Iran's activities and the focus on resolving uh, some of the problems that Iran posed has been very different. Um, in on the U.S. and the remainder of the P5 plus one side, the focus was very much on Iran's nuclear program. It was kind of the source of all uh, issues um, for the for a very long time, and it was it was a, it was a wall that had to be dealt with before you could engage Iran on a range of other issues. And so uh, President Obama made this a uh, made dealing with Iran's nuclear program a foreign policy priority. Now, of course, the Gulf Arabs um, have, for the longest time, said the nuclear is only the nuclear issue is only a minor issue, um, because at the end of the day, uh, what matters to us is what the Iranians are doing in the region. It's how it's involving itself in our affairs. It's how it's waging war against um, against us in different arenas in the region. Uh, and they always felt as though dealing with the nuclear crisis was uh, was, was sending them out. Because at the end of the day, it was such a minor issue for them um, that uh, focusing just on the nuclear issue basically meant that you would end up ignoring a range of other issues um, on on which uh, you, could, uh, you could engage Iran on, or at least on which you should contain Iran. So this has been a bit of a point of tension in, in GCC-US um, relations in the last little while. Uh, I think today the situation is a little bit different. President Trump has made it clear that um, that what Iran is doing in the region, its missile arsenal, uh, all of its nefarious activities are definitely something that he wants to focus on. Um, and as such, there's a little bit more alignment in the way that the GCC and the US sees the Iranian threat today. The problem is, by focusing on everything at once, you're making it, in, in my opinion, you're making it more difficult to deal with the Iranian threat because um, it's, it's much harder to deal with Iran and say everything you're doing is a problem, so we have to negotiate on all of it, rather than picking apart uh, each of the each of the arenas in which um, Iranian activities is problematic. Now, to quickly look at the other side, um, it, it's been very interesting. We uh, we were talking about this with Iranian officials last week in New York, and um, and and they were talking to us a lot about whether they thought and whether we thought it would be a good idea for them to engage um, with the current Trump administration. And to kind of give you a better idea of where they stand, um, there is, within Rouhani's administration, a real desire to sit down and talk with the Trump administration. But as Ali mentioned previously, the political cost is far too high. Um, on top of that, Iran really is winning the PR war today in terms of its position in the, in the in the community of nations, and, and as Ali mentioned, we saw that at the UN General Assembly last week. Um, so it fears that if it actually enters into any kind of dialogue with the Trump administration, um, A, that that dialogue wouldn't be very fruitful, because if they end up with a two-page document like um, like uh, President Trump did with the North Koreans, then the Iranians fear that after that, they're going to have to sit down and actually talk about everything that needs to be negotiated with members of Trump's cabinet um, and that is in no way going to be a fruitful negotiation because many members of his current cabinet want to uh, want to you know want regime change. Um, and secondly, um, they just they they, they fear um, that they will end up ruining this political game that they now have in terms of their alignment with the Europeans, their alignment with the Russians, with the Chinese, because all of these other countries will then feel um, left out if Iran engages with the US. So I think today, um, while they do want to have dialogue with the Trump administration, they don't really see any benefits um, from engaging with the US. OK, thanks, Dina. Um, Barbara, I'd like to ask if, if you could uh, address um, uh, any of these, but in particular, um, Harlan's question, why, these, why this huge difference in, in how Iran is seen as, a, on the one hand, a malign actor uh, engaged in, in all manner of nefarious activity, and uh, and then the way uh, at least two people on the panel here have, uh, have described it. Well, so I mean, look, you know, it's almost forty years of a of a of a times violent non relationship between uh, Washington and Tehran, and so we've seen this uh, this constant ebb and flow of of anger towards the Iranians for things that either that they do through pro proxies directed at us or. Uh, directly themselves, whether it's on the battlefields in Iraq over the course uh, of the war, and even after uh, uh, after the signing of a bilateral defense agreement with Baghdad, um, 
you know, attacks on the consulate in, in Baghdad in the wake of uh, protests that turned anti-Iranian and anti-militia in Basra um, a couple of weeks ago, the long legacy of the of the non-relationship, um, and you know, there there is certainly um, the last. Uh, period of time, I'd say the eight years of the Obama administration, where there was a, an upfront public effort by that president uh, to reset things with Iran. I, I think it was once again a, a long period of missed opportunities, an administration that focused uh, like a laser on one set of questions, didn't follow up on the heels of that with an effort at dealing with the regional dimension, which had definitely become much worse. And in a region that is, as I said earlier, is so disordered, um, Iran's activities ex accentuate, deepen that. And then you have, uh, to Alan's question, um, you know, this effort, which has been episodic over the last at least 10 years, to stitch together, um, you know, a formal defense security alliance among the GCC states, US, and to other uh, countries, Egypt and Jordan. And I mean, I, I see no prospects for that going forward, precisely because um, they are so riven internally. They've always, of the six, uh, among the six, they've always had slightly differing uh, approaches to dealing with Iran. They're very cauterized now, polarized um, over the issue of Qatar. Um, the splintering of that, um, of that grouping does cause a drift with countries like Oman. So disorder is heaped upon disorder. Um, the first question. Well, the first question had to do with the different uh, uh, threat perceptions. You know, yeah. of, are, the, uh, are the Gulf states' threat perceptions the same as the U.S.? And I think Dina answered. Yes, that she did. Well. Yes, she did. And so I would, I would just end with, you know, uh, the president very predictably. Uh, started pitching the idea of highest level meeting um, almost before he had uh, done with his first round on North Korea. That was, you could, you could, uh, you could just see that coming. Uh, I see very little prospects for that going forward right now, in no small part because of, of as as Ali said, um, hostility within the administration to that notion. Notwithstanding that the president leapfrogged over that with uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, but. You've got a long list of things to march through, and I don't think there's appetite there. Okay, thank you. Ali, you want to pick up on any of these? Just points? two very quick points. Uh, first, on the threat perception, you know, I think the problem is we're in a vicious cycle uh, in the sense that the Iranians do what they're doing in terms of their for for forward defense policy and ballistic missile program because they feel encircled by the United States and its allies, because they feel that they're inferior in terms of conventional military capabilities compared to other countries in the region. I mean, like take the UAE, right, in terms of its uh, Air Force capabilities. It can destroy Iranian Air Force in a matter of minutes because the Iranian Air Force dates back from the time of the Shah. It's a flying museum. Um, you know, uh, and, and the fact that Iran is totally excluded from the region's security architecture is not like Turkey, a member of NATO, it's not a member of GCC, it's alone, it provides for its own security. So it pursues these policies. The problem is these policies are seen, although from the Iranian perspective defensive, from the regional perspective they're seen as offensive, and they deepen concerns in the region that Iran is expanding and it's an, uh, is, has hegemonic ambitions in mind. Uh, and uh, they purchase more weapons. The U.S. sells them more weapons, which deepens Iran's sense of insecurity and this asymmetry, which again pushes Iran to double down uh, on its uh, uh, defensive policies. And, and this cycle goes on and on. And I actually fault the Obama administration for this issue as well. What did Obama do in order to um, strike a balance after the JCPOA? He sold the Saudis and the Emiratis billions and billions of weapons. Uh, which deepened Iran's uh, insecurity again, and the Iranians continued with their ballistic missile program, which is what now this administration blames the JCPOA for. So you see how this vicious cycle works. Um, on MESA, I can tell you what the Iranians think. They're not taking it seriously. I mean, they've seen this movie before. Uh, they know it's not going to go anywhere. They see it as a way of uh, the US and its uh, Western allies selling more arms in the region. Okay, thanks, Ali. That's that's a nice, concise answer. Let's go for one more round here. Um, come up, come up to the front if you would. We got two people up here, and then we got two in the back. We'll try to take four 
I'm sorry, we need, we'll take three people up here, yeah. Thank you very much for this excellent discussion. I have a quick question on language, and it's prompted by, Mark, your, your comment thanking Dina for not using loaded adjectives like malign. But how do we talk about Iran's activities in the region? Policymakers don't have the time to go into the details you do, and they use very short sentences. And I happen to be working on a joint statement with a group of experts, and the first draft has words like Iran support for terrorism. Iran's aggression in the region, Iran's uh, destabilizing activities. And that, to me, falls into the Saudi characterization of Iran as the source of the conflict rather than Iran as one of the participants in the conflict. So I'm looking for some insights from you about what adjectives, what words, how do we get an objective description of the kinds of activities we oppose without uh, oversimplifying uh, and demonizing uh, one party in the conflicts. Thanks, Joe. Pass the microphone right and back to you, and both of the gentlemen here will. Uh, yeah, I, I know we're mostly focused on short-term things, but my question is really. Name, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Rick Rowden. I'm a graduate student at uh, JNU in New Delhi. Um, the, my question is about long-term economic development issues, and um, you know, uh, Iran is a um, is an observer status member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization which is really put together by Russia and China. But actually, quite interestingly, both India and Pakistan joined and became full members last year. Turkey and Iran are both still observer status, but they would like to join. There's a whole broad other set of economic integration issues going on with China's Belt and Road Initiative, but also other initiatives throughout the Asian mainland. Um, to what extent do you see Iran uh, having a long-term economic interest in integration, economic integration with Russia and China and the region, and to what degree do you think that those long-term economic considerations temper some of the short-term strategic concerns you're talking about? Okay, if I didn't know better, I'd say Dina planted that question because she just <laughs> she just wrote a book about uh, Iran, China, and Russia. Uh, so Dina, you get that question when we come to it. But uh, yes, please. Talal uh, Absi, Mr. Bahrain. So if I may, Mark, make a comment rather than a question. Please. Just kind of. To, yeah, um, I wanted you to. Yeah, okay. fair enough. So, um, you know, I represent Bahrain. Bahrain is a tiny country, quarter the size of Rhode Island, if you don't know. And for us, we'd rather have very healthy relations with our neighbors, including Iran, which we share a lot with. Um, but we should, in the way that I see kind of the debate is trying to rationalize the kind of the Iranian behavior, we should not kind of forget that they were made by Iranian choices. By Iranian, I mean the Iranian regime. We should distinguish, distinguish between the people and the regime. And to a certain extent, I agree with Brian Hawke when he said the 12 or were they like 13 demands are defined, the scope of them are defined by Iranian actions, not the other way around. So <clears throat> I believe it's very important that we um, r remember that it's the, the Iranian regime that's been doing that and we shouldn't make it any easier for them and definitely, as Secretary Pompeo said once, or maybe more than once, that um, we should make it more exp expensive for the Iranians to do business in the region. Thank you, Talal, for taking up my, uh, my request to, uh, to give a counterpoint. Um, uh, okay, we're going we're gonna to go a little bit over, if you don't mind, but if anybody needs to leave, go ahead and leave. But we'll take these two last questions here. Um, why are we seeing this as a two-way competition between Iran and the Arab states? Isn't it more accurate to see it as a three-way competition between Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia? And isn't it fundamentally a competition over who gets to define what Islam is and therefore becomes in a position to dominate the, uh, the Muslim world, essentially, but particularly this part of the Muslim world? Okay, thanks. And final um uh, hi, my name is Ismail Jalilov. I'm with Freedom House. I work on Azerbaijan and its Eurasia program. I wanted to briefly direct your attention to the north, since we've been talking about the west and the south for a while. Um, to what extent is Azerbaijan, the country to the north of Iran, uh, sort of figures into Iran's uh, foreign policy? To what extent is it important? Because 
I'm asking this question from the background of the recently leaked story about the Israeli bombers landing in Azerbaijan after a strike. It was a plan, but it was a widely discussed plan from what I understand. And Iran's very counterintuitive support to the neighboring Armenia in the war between Azerbaijan and Iran. Here you have the country that used to be your land 200 years ago. You have the people. So you basically understand the premise of my question, yeah. if you don't mind. Okay, Thank you. Good. Thanks. Um, okay, so we got uh, five points here, and I'll just uh, uh, summarize them. One is uh, Joe Serencioni's question about how do we talk about Iran's role uh, without uh, using loaded uh, uh, adjectives. A question about long-term development issues, the Iran's role in the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. Uh, does it have any long-term interests, uh, particularly with Russia and China? Uh, Dean, I'm going to give you the floor in a minute to address that one. Uh, Talal's uh, comment, not a question about, um, you know, that. The response is because of Iran's behavior, and uh, it shouldn't be rationalized. Uh, the last two questions were, um, uh, you know, isn't it a three-way competition with, with Turkey, not just Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia, and competition over what Islam is? is. Uh, and then the final one, drawing in yet another uh, player, Azerbaijan, how does it figure into Iran's foreign policy? Uh, I'm not sure we can get to all of those, but... Uh, uh, Dina, give us a short burst on, on, on the one that you know the best. Not, not the whole book, but just the, the, the first two sentences. Well, first, I thank you very much for asking that question, because it allows me to shamelessly plug in uh, the book that we've been talking about, which is about Iran's relations with um, Russia and China that's coming out this month in the US, I think. Um, so, Basically, Iran's relationship with Russia and China has, uh, has been incredibly interesting because it's basically grown out of the, the, the context of isolation that the Islamic Republic has found itself in since the, since the beginning of the Islamic Republic, right? Um, when it became clear that it wasn't going to be able to establish ties with the, with, um, with the West, um, uh, Iran very much turned east. Um, after a period of wanting to stand on its own two feet and, and then realizing that that wasn't really possible. And so that was the, that was the origins of this relationship. And, this, and, and Iran's relationship with both countries has been incredibly rocky, but also incredibly pragmatic, which means that there have been areas where they've really been able to sit down and, and, uh, and have good relations, good negotiations, fruitful negotiations on specific economic issues, on specific political issues, and then areas where they, you know, but in heads, they tended to ignore it. So the, the, the relationship is very much compartmentalized, um, which I think goes a long way towards explaining why it's been a, why they've been able to sustain it for so long. Um, economically, the Iranians, uh, under the previous round of sanctions, when they were fully isolated, really relied on Russia and China to help them uh, weather this isolation as much as possible. And it's important for us to remember that throughout the entire period where the US and the Europeans were not present in the Iranian market, the Russians and the Chinese were, which means they know the market incredibly well, they have very good contacts on the ground, um, and, and today, even, let's say, you know, the JCPOA wasn't in the situation that it was in, and that rather European companies were flooding the Iranian market, they would still be at a disadvantage compared to the Russians and the Chinese, because the Russians and the Chinese know exactly who to talk to, where to go, and how to navigate the system. Um, and the Iranians were very aware of this. Uh, nevertheless, they conducted these negotiations for the JCPOA, and they really tried to ensure that they would be able to open their market up to the West, all the while keeping the Russians and the Chinese on the back burner. Um, and as it became clearer and clearer that they weren't going to be able to get what they wanted out of the deal in terms of opening up to the West, it became clear that the Russians and the Chinese were really going to be um, Iran's main economic partners, but also political and military partners for the foreseeable future. And so in Iranian policymakers' minds today, there is no doubt that despite the suspicion they have of those two countries, despite the perhaps lack of quality of the products that they get from those two countries, mm -hmm. despite some of the, the uh, situations where they felt as though Russia and China were dragging their feet, so the Russians, for example, on Iran's nuclear program, the Chinese in building some of Iran's real uh, infrastructure, um, the Iranians have, have basically accepted that these are the countries that they're going to be dealing with for the foreseeable future. Um, and so their attention was very much turned that way, and as we've said, 
they've got observer status in the, in the Shanghai Cooperation Council. They're really trying to push that. Every time Rouhani goes to one of their meetings, he comes out and really makes a big show of the fact that the meeting went very well, the negotiations went very well. Every time there is a visit to Russia and China by Iranian officials, it's too great. Uh, you know, great PR and fanfare, and they come back and, 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 and they talk about it in the Iranian media and really play it up. Um, it's, it's clear today that uh, the Iranians are very much set um, on dealing with Russia and China. Okay, when we thanks. When spoke to them last week and asked them, the Iranian officials, and asked them about how they felt about the future of that relationship, given today that they're being increasingly squeezed by the West, um, and how they felt the Chinese were dealing with them, the Iranians were, um, they kind of put their hands up and they said, well, listen, we know we have to deal with them. They know they have to deal with us. They know perhaps that we're in slightly more of a position of weakness than we would have been had the Europeans come into our market. Uh, they're tough negotiators. Dina, Dina um, I'm, I'm going to... You've got more to say than we have time to... Uh, because <laughs> you've got a whole book, but I think we're going to have to probably um, turn to the other two if you don't mind. But I'm sorry, cut you off mid-sentence. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so, Barbara, the remaining questions were um, uh, adjectives, um, uh, rationalizing Turkey and Azerbaijan. Um, I, I would simply say destructive. I, I think it's, 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 in, it's fairly neutral. It's fairly analytical. And I, I mean destructive in two directions. Destructive to the, the fabric of different Arab polities. And, and Iraq is a case in point. Syria is another one, Lebanon above all. Um, Bahrain, Yemen. Um, Bahrain has been more resilient for a variety of reasons, but there is no credible uh, reason for the Iranians to, to ship lethal aid and do training of Bahrainis. There simply isn't. Now, destructive to the, so, to the fabric of these Arab polities, but also destructive to Iran's interests, because over the longer term, this proliferation of these militias uh, that, that morph into political actors but are outside state control in Iraq, ultimately that has, that has a disaster effect internally. It can certainly regenerate, uh, be one of the accelerants for ISIS. That's a direct threat to, to Iran. I think I'll stop there. Thanks. You know, that would have been a kind of an, a good place to, to stop, but I want to give Ali the last word, actually. I'm sorry, Mark, for... Um, uh, preventing you from stopping where you wanted, but I'll be very short. Just on this, I know you'll be good, well. so that's fine. Just on this question, uh, you know, I think um, we have had experience with hyping threats, mishandling them, and exacerbating them in the process of mishandling them uh, before in the region. But it seems that we haven't learned the lesson. Uh, and this whole campaign of demonizing Iran and portraying it as a source of all, all evil uh, in the region is quite problematic because. You know, I mean, I would agree with Barbara to describe Iran's role in the region as destructive only, it, uh, only if we could describe everybody else's policies in the region as constructive. I don't, I don't think what the Saudis are doing in Yemen is constructive. Um, or what the U.S. did in Iraq and, and, uh, in 03 was a stabilizing act, uh, right? So everybody as, as, is at blame. And at the end of the day, I think the problems of the region will not be resolved unless we realize that all of these countries in the region have a right to uh, play a role in the region and have legitimate security concerns, and there needs to be a security architecture that takes that into account regardless of the size of these countries and uh, the length of their uh, statehood or uh, their population. Um, and as long as we look at this as a zero-sum game, this dynamic will just continue in different forms. Um, and you know, I, I think the administration's line that Iran is not a normal country, what Iran is doing is just not normal, uh, will basically prevent us from ever reaching that point and is bound to deepen uh, the tensions in the region. And just one last point on, on other actors. I think if you look at this as a geostrategic uh, competition, it's a better way of understanding the regional dynamics. Uh, rather than as a sectarian or uh, ideological messianic uh, 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 venture by, by any of the countries in the region. Um, and what I want to point to is, a, is, uh, is an important factor in Iran-Turkey relations that everybody else, I think, is overlooking, which is the fact that these two countries have been historic competitors for influence in the region. 
But nevertheless, have always had a civilized relationship. You know, the, the border between Iran and Turkey is the most stable border in the region. Um, and, um, and, and the two countries continue to do trade, have people-to-people uh, -people relations. Uh, nevertheless, they have significant disagreements uh, in the region. And I think that, I wish that was a model that we could apply to Iran and Saudi Arabia or Iran and, uh, um, you know, Bahrain or, or other countries in the region. Um, and I'll stop at that. Thank okay, you. well, that's also not a bad place to end. And, uh, and, and you know, Turkey gets a, a, a seen as a model for something. So that's a, a bad. Look, thanks very much for joining us for this uh, Prima Nama Dialogue discussion. Please thank uh, the panelists. Um, for those who did not get enough uh, intellectual nourishment uh, uh, from this uh, discussion, we had two pamphlets out in, in the back there. Uh, Ali uh, kindly brought along several copies of his uh, um, uh, uh, on Iran's priorities in a turbulent Middle East. And we also put out something that my colleague Mike Elliman uh, organized about um, uh, Gulf security after 2020. It's mostly about uh, Iran's um, uh, military um, uh, priorities and, um, and procurements looking ahead, but very relevant to this subject. Thanks very much for coming. We're going to have more of these discussion meetings uh, if we can get them going. Thanks. <laughs>